it is five o'clock at 10 o'clock in Houston, five o'clock in Italy. And uh, guys, whatever time you are on, let's start. So welcome to everybody. Welcome to our new webinar. Uh, first time we run this webinar, choosing our the best solution for EX. And uh, here's Bob, our presenter today. Uh, most of you might know him, but for those who do not, let me spend a couple of words about him. Uh, he has many years, <laughs> don't want to say any more 30 because- Oh, no, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. enough. Yes, many, many years of experience in the EX world. And he's also a CompiX instructor as well as an instructor on the ICEX CompiC scheme. And he's an inspector. So he's done many, many inspection, you know, for the US ULSDP committee. And of course he ran his company. Uh, and dealing mostly in EX equipment. So he has a lot of, a lot of experience in this world. And for the many webinars we've been together, Bob, I don't remember how many, but you know, you never fail to deliver to all. <laughs> well, there's always a first. There's always a first. I am, I'm Paolo, I'm Paolo Landrini. I'm the VP of sales of GM International. And let me spend a couple of words about GM that is presenting this webinar, only a couple of minutes. So we are, we are a safety company. We manufacture, design, engineer, a complete line of intrinsically safe and certified devices that are used in automation packages from uh, DCS to SCADA, ESD, BMS, and so on. Uh, primarily in the oil and gas, petrochemical industry, but also elsewhere, including mining, food and bed, fertilizer, and so on. We have over 40 years of experience, and we're very proud to manufacture 100% of our product here in our headquarters near Milan, Italy. On the other end, we are a global player. We presence all around the world. We have uh, nine, used to be 10, but you know, the world has changed and uh, our Russian friends, fortunately, are no longer with us. And um, we have many distributors and we run many courses as well as webinars. So we run um, EX courses, uh, financial safety engineering courses and so on. And we have many, many installations globally. Uh, because we make safety products that are using safety industry, they make safe your plant, our world. Uh, we try to do it best we can. So we use state-of-the-art technology. We have 100% traceability, 100% testing. Every single item coming out of our factory is fully tested. We offer five-year warranty and 10 years guarantee of availability. Uh, we can go next. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no problem. And to, uh, to you know, our words are backed up by certifications. We have global certifications, uh, over 15 independent agencies. We have two functional safety management certification, C3. Of course, 9,001, 41,000, Rich and Ross, and so on. And these are next, sorry, Bob. No, no, no. I, I, I just going very fast today. <laughs> these are the product we manufacture and sell, IS barrier up to SEAL 3 certification. We have safety relay, also SEAL certified, SEAL 3, SEAL 2, which are with line and without line monitoring. Uh, but I think we are the global leader for line monitoring safety relay. We have isolators, also SEAL certified. We have a line of power supply, EX and SEAL certified. And the line of multiplexer, temperature, digital, heart multiplexer. Uh, we interface with most of the system out there using our uh, FTA or termination panel designed for you know, Snyder, Yokogawa, Honeywell, Emerson, ADB, and, you know, all of them. We have a line of SPDs, some loop indicator. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a division that does training and services in the functional safety and EX. Some of our customers, basically all the Mac, many PCs, uh, a lot of end users. And of course, we're very proud of, uh, we list here some of our OEM customers. So those that install the product into their equipment, whether it's a, dr a drilling rig or a, a skid or some kind of machine that is out in the field because our products are very, very reliable. Okay, I believe that's my part, Bob. If you go next. Okay, 
We have you. Okay, so uh, before I let Bob start, I remind you that there is a way for you to get in contact with us through the question and answer box. We have collected your questions and that have been posed through the registration process. We will answer those at the end. But in the meantime, if you want to pose a question, you can feel free to do so. Okay, great, Paul. I'm here. I might get out of the way, but I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> well, fantastic. Well, thank you, Paulo. Thank you for the introduction. And yes, more than 30 years. I, I hate to remind myself of that. <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy to be here today because I was actually up in British Columbia flying out yesterday and I wasn't 100% sure I was going to make it. So I did. I got back to Houston uh, late yesterday. And unfortunately, where I was flying from, there was only one flight a day, but I made it by 15 minutes. So oh. I am, uh, I am very happy to be here. And, and by the way, I, I was doing inspections for a company that actually had some GMI products uh, in their in their system. So it was nice to see some GMI products hard at work. So Great. choosing the, the right concept. This is always a, a, a difficult one. And I think it's a, it's a relevant one because uh, sometimes you know, we will, as, as Paulo said, we, we get involved in the selling of products. We have different options that people can look at. We see specifications coming in from companies from all over the world sometimes. And, you know, I question things. Why are they doing it this way? Why are they doing it that way? This is definitely a topic that I think we could talk about for hours and hours and hours on end. Uh, there's good, bad, and different. So I'm just going to share with you uh, the protection concepts in general, but give you my opinions. Now, again, these are my opinions. You may disagree. That's fine. Uh, we can agree to disagree, so to speak. So it, there's not necessarily what I'm going to tell you is necessarily what you should be doing, but it's it's something that I've learned over the years of dealing in the EX business, seeing solutions from various manufacturers and various technologies that are out there that sometimes it's important for us to maybe restop and think, hey, what are we doing? How are we doing it the best way with the selection of products and the protection concepts could we do something easier, better, faster, quicker? So that's really what this whole webinar is, is going to try to hopefully at least give you my opinions on some of the some of the various things that are out there. So really, when we talk about selecting the appropriate protection concept, we we really have to go back to the basics. And a lot of this, I'm I'm not I'm not going to spend much time on this, but basically everything that we want to put into a hazardous area specifically from electrical and mechanical equipment, we want to address the explosive triangle, right? We've all seen this in some way, shape, or form, but basically the whole intent of EX equipment is to remove or eliminate one or more of these legs of this triangle so we can safely apply electrical or mechanical equipment into a hazardous area. So we have our explosive material, typically a vapor. We have some sort of air, oxygen, and a source of ignition. So if we think about it, right, all kinds of energy can be sources of ignition. We think of the common ones like electrical arcing and sparking, but we just had an explosion of a, of a train that took place up in Ohio, released a tremendous amount of pollution into the atmosphere. And it sounds like actually it was an overheated bearing on this train that actually was the source of ignition that they're now starting to find out, unfortunately. So again, mechanical equipment can be can be, in many cases, just as dangerous as electrical equipment. So when we think about all the various EX protection concepts that are out there, we basically have four main categories that we break these down into. So we have what is called energy limitation. It's, it's commonly, you know, intrinsic safety falls into this. So we're limiting the amount of energy. So in our triangle, we're basically eliminating, in effect, the explosive arc or spark. There's what is also called non-sparking, which again, we're eliminating the sparking by the use of increased safety. With containment, flame-proof, and some of the other protection concepts, we're not eliminating any of those legs, but we're basically containing them within some sort of solution, either a flame-proof box, um, EXQ, which is quartz or sand filled, is actually considered to be containment. And then finally, separation. Separation uh, could be where we're separating one or more of those legs from the others. So pressurization is a good example where we're basically removing, in effect, any flammable gas air mixture from getting into contact to the relevant surfaces on the inside of an enclosure. 
For dust hazards, we basically have the same kinds of concepts. We're just somewhat limited. All of these concepts are spelled out within the 60079 standards. In Europe, we follow the EN versions. In the international world, we follow the IEC versions. And in the US, we actually have published them as UL standards. And in various parts of the world, we basically uh, pretty much follow the same types of EX requirements in some way, shape, or form. Um, as a user of EX equipment, I always tell people, you don't necessarily need to know exactly all the details as to what constitutes how to build a flame-proof enclosure or how to build an intrinsically safe barrier. But you do need to know, obviously, how to apply them. So the application standard that you really need to know is the 60079-14 standard. That's our standard that tells us what particular concepts we can use and how we bring it all together. So we'll, we've talked about this in other webinars. We won't really get into that today, but that's again, the standard that you would really wanna focus your attention on. So what are some of the protection concepts that we follow? Uh, again, these are the relevant standards for flame proof, which we now market as e either EXDA, DB, or DC. Many of you might've been familiar with the old marking requirements. Flame proof used to be just EXD but it's now been divided up into three different protection concepts, depending on the gas group or depending on the zone specifically. And the same thing holds true for a lot of these other protection concepts. So our first one, energy limitation, intrinsic safety. What we're doing here is limiting the amount of energy below the minimum ignition energy for the particular gas group environment. Uh, it's divided up into three different ranges. EXIA, which is double fault tolerant, IB, single fault tolerant, or IC, no fault tolerant. So those are basically uh, protection concepts. And again, they all operate in the same fashion. We're limiting the amount of energy that could be released into that hazardous atmosphere. So non-sparking, EXE, is a good example. Uh, what we do here is that we obviously have certain segregation between uh, energized conductors. We have non-sparking that takes place. So therefore, if we make sure that we have proper creepage and clearance distances between terminals, then we can take all that and put that into a hazardous location. There's a lesser form of this called EXNA that's suitable for zone two only. Uh, the requirements and tolerances for EXNA are basically a little bit less than for EXE, but it's the same concept. So now, again, there's no arcing or sparking. We've removed, in effect, the ignition source from a flammable atmosphere. Now, this was a poll question that we actually did not cover. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so Bob over. wants to keep us awake, make sure we are, we actually <laughs> wants to test us. Make sure we know. Because you cannot participate in our webinar if you don't know, cannot answer this question. <laughs> what is the definition of a flashpoint? <laughs> Uh, but it's interesting, you know. Uh, yeah, well, throw, you have throw, four throw. choices. Only one is correct. I had to while I was waiting for you and listening to you, I had an opportunity to look it up. <laughs> right. So I just we wanted to make sure I had the right answer. <laughs> but so uh, we, we we obviously haven't covered this, but uh, so you won't get you won't get dinged if you don't know actually what the term flash. I know, so it's only uh, enough in the webinar so that we. No, there's none of you is still asleep. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, it's interesting. I have a question, flashpoint. Right? Is it temperature which I guess A or B sounds to me the most uh, probable? Most, answer, most you know? logical, yeah. Most logical temperature which gas or vapor will spontaneously ignite or in which turn into flammable gas. Yeah. Right. So, the so correct still answer. answering. Oh, so you want to give you a few more minutes? Okay. But a few more seconds, let's say, because we have to move on. Uh, let me do this. And I think I I handed, I believe my answer is B, but uh, let's see what you guys said. Yeah. So so the correct answer is B. Ah, so okay. flashpoint <laughs> is the temperature in which a flammable liquid will turn into a flammable gas. So uh, if you think about it inside of a tank uh, that might be holding a lot of flammable liquids, if you will, the liquids themselves will not actually ignite. It's the vapors that will ignite. 
So we're not so much concerned about the liquid, but we are concerned about obviously the vapors. Now that some people get that confused with the ignition temperature and ignition temperature is actually A, that's the temperature in which a gas or vapor will spontaneously ignite. So the ignition temperature is always the temperature above flashpoint. So flashpoint for a lot of liquids and vapors can be extremely cold. You know, most of them are below freezing, but ignition temperatures could be extremely high. So ignition temperatures are also what we have to be concerned with. Flashpoint is really, we get into it when we're starting to talk about area classification um, that we need to be aware of at what point do we create a vapor that could ignite. So that's the difference. Okay, I'm, I guarantee you next one you'll be able to, to answer. Yeah, I think we cover, I think we cover some of the yeah, other Yeah, we cover. <laughs> and uh, you know, it made me think of something that is stupid, but you know, all, all motorcycle, abandoned motorcycle, you know, the, the gas tank was empty. So we thought it was not flammable, but there was a lot of vapor in there. And, Oh it, yeah, it was a big flame when we played with it <laughs> as a kid, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's one thing you see, you go on YouTube and you see people putting gasoline on fire or to start a fire or something like that, and then they stand. You know, gasoline vapors are heavier than air, so they'll start to traverse along the ground, and all of a sudden they throw a match into it. The next thing you know, they're on fire because they didn't take into account the vapors that will actually travel along the surface and they're standing in effect a hazardous location. Same so path. yeah, same thing. Okay. So, so getting back to some of the other protection concepts, one of the most common one is obviously flame proof. And then again, as I mentioned, we're not eliminating any one of the legs of the triangle, but we're basically containing them into an enclosure in which this will contain the explosive uh, explosion, if you will, and cool off the hot flaming gas to where it gets outside, it releases, it's cool enough to where it will not ignite the outside. So this concept is basically also used here in the United States. We call it explosion proof. Flame proof and explosion proof are the same exact concept, although explosion proof does have different requirements. There are, a, it's a different standard that we actually have to test it to. It's slightly more onerous uh, than the requirements for flame proof. But again, there are some other concept, uh, sand or quartz filled, you could find products like that. You could find a selector switch, you could find a, uh, an actuator of some sort that actually is flame proof. There's many different variations of flame proof out there. And it's one of the older concepts. The, the two oldest concepts that we really recognized for many, many years was intrinsic safety and flame proof. So those have been around for many years many of these other concepts kind of grew over the last you know, 40, 50 years and uh, have become much more popular. And then finally, separation, right? Now we're talking about things like encapsulation. We're taking maybe some sort of arcing device and we're encapsulating it in a resin. This could be a ballast, it could be a solenoid valve, it could be all different kinds of products. Uh, we could hermetically seal it, make it a glass tight seal. Uh, the common one is pressurization, where we're pressurizing an enclosure. We're taking a lot of general purpose equipment, putting it into a large enclosure, and we're pressurizing it, keeping the flammable gas air mixtures out. But then there's some other concepts, oil immersion and restricted breathing, which are also separation. So again, we're removing the ignition source from the flammable atmosphere. So here's the key things to understand before we actually start determining which protection concept is the best one to use, right? Well, we have to understand, obviously, what zone we're going into. Um, zone zero, zone one, or zone two. Now, zone zero is the most onerous. That's an area in which a flammable gas air mixture is present pretty much continuously. So there's really only two protection concepts that are recognized that are suitable for zone zero. And that's EXIA and EXMA as two of the protection concepts. So if we are talking, and by the way, the area in which we find a zone zero is typically inside of a process tank or vessel where we're storing uh, a flammable gas or flammable liquid. So generally speaking, we're not going to want to put things like motor starters or you know high powered equipment on the inside of these devices. Anyway, we're really limited to things like intrinsic safety. 
The second thing we have to understand, and this is something that a lot of people forget about, is the gas group. What gases are present? Because not all protection concepts are suitable for all gas groups. Or I should say, they may be suitable, but maybe the product is not suitable. Maybe, for example, a lot of flame-proof products you'll find out there might be suitable for 2A or even 2B, but uh, they're very, very limited for 2C gases. So we may not have that option to go with flame-proof when we're dealing with a 2C gas environment. Doesn't mean we can't, there are, it's just that we're somewhat limited in our selection. And then certainly the temperature code, right? Uh, the inspection that I was doing was an LNG-fueled vessel, and methane is primarily the, the main gas that's part of LNG. Uh, so methane is actually a very easy gas to deal with because it's a T1 gas. So we have to understand the relevant surface temperature of our product. We have to compare the T codes of the products that we want to select versus what is our environment in which we want to place it into. So T1 is actually the easiest because anything that has a T code is going to be suitable for a T1 gas environment. Um, the other thing about methane or LNG, which makes it somewhat easier than many other industrial gases and vapors, methane is a 2A gas. So anything that has uh, a, a gas rating is going to be suitable for it. Anything that has a T, T rating is going to be suitable for it. Uh, we're just going to be more limited by the zones. And then certainly, what is our ambient requirement? Certain products generate a tremendous amount of heat, so we are limited somewhat to the ambient in which we need to place our equipment into. The default for EX equipment is minus 20 to plus 40, but yet you'll find a lot of applications and you'll find a lot of product that are rated at either much higher or much lower temperatures than ambient. But these are the four main things that we really need to understand before we get into the selection of our protection concepts. Once we do this, then we can start making some, uh, some, some uh, selections, so to speak. Okay, so here's the next poll. Oh, and why, you know, it's about intrinsic safety. Uh, what uh, is it, this product? Protection concept constitute what protection concept constitute IS? Uh, while you answer that, Bob, we have a couple of questions. Maybe you can go a little more in detail of what's in increased safety. Sure. Yeah. So increased safety is a concept. And again, we're removing any arcing or sparking, right? So generally, the first the first increased safety products that were brought out were boxes, junction boxes because we would say, hey, look, we're just making connection points with inside this box. We really shouldn't have any arcing or sparking going on, but we wanna make sure that these terminals are designed to where A, number one, they won't loosen up under vibration. So we couldn't have a potential arc or spark or separation. And that we make, make sure that we have a certain creepage and clearance distances. Those are the distances via surface and via air. And as long as we maintain a certain distance between each circuit, then we are, we are minimizing or eliminating the possibility of tracking a potential short between two electrical circuits. So that's the whole concept of increased safety. And what's happened over the years, it started off with just terminal blocks, but then we started to incorporate it into other products. So as we'll see here in just a minute, you might find a flame-proof switch that maybe is just an individual switch with a contact block that's flame proof, but yet the terminals on the backside of it are, are not intrinsically safe, they're increased safety. They also have to meet those certain creepage and clearance distances. Okay. So we combine those techniques into one product and make it suitable for an area classification. How about the difference between EXD, ABC? I never heard of it either. Yeah, so legacy EXD. Uh, the old flame proof was uh, suitable for zone one and zone two installations. What has happened is that the IEC standards have changed here within the last, well, it's been a while now, but they've now incorporated what is called EPLs. There's A, B, and C, just like on intrinsic safety, IA, IB, and IC. So now we've done the same thing with other protection concepts. So now there's actually a flame proof standard for use of flame proof product in a zone zero environment. Now, 
there's I've only seen of one particular product that was built uh, around that because the requirements for flame proof for zone zero is a very, very, very difficult one to achieve, but it does exist. And so now we've actually, the legacy old EXD is now basically defaulted to, now it's known as EXDB. So uh, you'll, you'll see some products. It's about the different years. areas where they can be used, the different zones. Yeah, it's, that's basically, that last letter is, is more or less telling us what zone we can use this protection concept in. And here's your answer, guys. 78% uh, answer correctly. Well, am I right? The answer, the correct answer yes. was... Yeah, the correct answer is C. Limit C. amount of energy that can be released into the... The atmosphere. last one was a little misleading, you know. Yeah, well, eliminating or reducing the heat or sparks in a hazardous area, that's, that's more like increased safety, if you will. Yeah. Okay, uh, great. But still, so, you know, you're on, on top, guys. Thanks. Thanks for participating. Let's go forward. Yep. There'll be one more poll for you guys later on. So a couple generalities, right? So intrinsically safe. Uh, every now and then somebody will ask, hey, I want to do intrinsic safety on this. And then we start looking at their application. It's like, nope, can't do it because we're basically limited to about one watt of power or less. So Using intrinsic safety uh, motor starters or an intrinsically safe motor, you know, is just not, it doesn't exist. It's a unicorn, so to speak. So we are really limited in with intrinsic safety to pretty much instrumentation circuits, right? Four to 20 milliamp signals are perfectly that sweet spot, if you will, for intrinsic safety. So again, extrinsic safety is great for instrumentation circuits, but, but really not applicable for many others. Uh, another thing, increased safety is not gas group dependent. So as I mentioned about the three different gas groups, 2A, 2B, 2C, increased safety doesn't care. Uh, so every increased safety product will be suitable for all gas groups. So if we have a 2C environment, uh, which is hydrogen and acetylene, increased safety might be one of the best ways to look at it uh, because we're not limited from gas group standpoint. And generally, increased safety is suitable uh, because it's not, it should not be generating a tremendous amount of heat. So it's good for almost all temperature codes as well. So increased safety is certainly one of the most popular protection concepts. But again, the issue is you know, what we can put inside of an increased safety box requires the use of an, a, an additional protection concept. So we can't just take a standard motor starter off the shelf and put it inside of a sheet metal box and just say, hey, that's increased safety. We cannot do that. The products that go inside of an increased safety enclosure must also be have its independent EX protection concept. Things like encapsulation, quartz sand filled, they're generally down at the component level, right? So we don't, you know, I, I had one guy one time ask me, he says, why can't we just take an enclosure and we'll put everything arcing and sparking and then we'll just fill it up with an encapsulation. I said, well, you could. The problem is you'd never be able to service it. <laughs> you'd never be able to inspect it. So it would be basically a disposable panel, if you will, but it would be safe. <laughs> so encapsulation and quartz or sand filled are something that usually has to be done by the manufacturer and it usually is limited to individual components. Again ballast, uh, it could be actuators, it could be solenoid valves, uh, those types of products. Uh, fuse holders, you could do something like that. Um, flame proof and pressurization allow the use of non-EX equipment to be used in hazardous areas. So that's a benefit of flame proof and pressurization. Now we can use general purpose equipment in hazardous locations. So maybe we cannot find EX whatever widget um, so certainly flame proof and pressurization allow the use. Please remember this, EXN equipment, which are basically disappearing and being subgroups uh, within the other protection concepts, which will be now known easier as DC, EC, so forth and so on, they're limited to zone two only. So we cannot use those uh, protection concepts in a zone one area. That's our requirement or a zone zero. Right. So some of the advantages and disadvantages of all the concepts, right? Flame proof. It's it's one of the easier ones to apply. It's a fairly simple concept. 
We take arcing and sparking components. We put them in a big cast enclosure. Uh, we can make pretty much any electrical component suitable. It's very robust, right? They're large, heavy, thick. Uh, can be cost effective depending on the product involved. And it's also fairly easy to combine with other techniques. So you still see a tremendous amount of flame proof out there. Now, what you're seeing on the right-hand side is actually a combination of an increased safety enclosure connected to a flame proof enclosure. So where what's happened here is that people will take, say, the arcing components, put them inside the EXD box, and the non-arcing components or certified components will be located within the E box. And then it's sealed in between the two and all your field connections are made into an EXE enclosure. Now this could be a big benefit specifically from cabling and wiring, because now all of a sudden, instead of having to use maybe a barrier gland, direct entry into a flame proof box, we're now using an increased safety box, which we do not require the use of a barrier gland. So some of the disadvantages, right? And there are many with flame proof. Uh, if we don't tighten the bolts, right? We've now lost our protection. If we paint the joint, um, if we use the wrong materials, we use a flame proof enclosure made out of a cast aluminum, but it's in a particular environment in which aluminum reacts violently to, uh, maybe it won't last very long, right? Scratches, if we damage any of our flame-proof joints, at that particular point in time, this product is worthless. We have to be very, very, very careful and gentle with our flame-proof joints. This is one thing that people forget about, but we cannot have an obstruction, depending on the gas group, uh, within 10 to 40 millimeters of the flame proof flat joint. So we don't want to take a box like what you see at the very top and mount that directly next to some sort of structure because we need to allow a gap, if you will, to allow that hot flaming gas to escape outside of that enclosure. Uh, using the wrong cable glands or blind plugs, we use EXE as opposed to EXD. The big issue is improperly installed cable glands. You know, with EXD, Cable glands are usually one of the biggest issues that we see during inspections, that either they've used the right gland, but they haven't installed it properly. Uh, they may not have packed a barrier gland properly, so forth and so on. And they are heavy and difficult to service, right? You've got to remove a lot of bolts. Uh, it, it's very heavy and cast. If we make changes to the contents of our EXD box, at that point, uh, we have violated, in effect, the certification because we've made an authorization or an unauthorized modification to that enclosure. And then lastly, you can buy boxes with either empty with a use certificate or with a assembly certificate. Unfortunately, people buy boxes empty and they populate it and they go ahead and do everything. And then somebody like me goes out there and looks at it and they say, hey, this is a use certificate. It's only a component. You cannot use this unless it's assessed as a complete assembly. So that's a big no-no that sometimes we do see, a U-component certificate on a flame-proof box. So some of the advantages of increased safety. Uh, one of the big advantages is lightweight materials. Now we can use things like glass reinforced polyester. We can use sheet stainless steel. We can use materials that are more appropriate, if you will, for a particular petrochem gas environment, right? very robust. Again, it's not gas group dependent, so we can use it in all gas groups. Generally, our T codes allow us to use these products in areas in which the ignition temperature of a gas is pretty low. Uh, generally, it is an easier cable gland installation because now we're using EXE glands. And in many cases, the cost can be lower. Now, I say that you can buy a control station like what you see right there with the start-stop button with EX uh, D, contact blocks on the inside with increased safety terminals on the inside. And the market price might be $100 to $150, depending on where you are in the world. Maybe higher, don't think any lower. But you could actually buy a cast flame-proof EXD for maybe the less, uh, in some cases significantly less. So a cost associated with just the material cost you could actually find in certain markets 
an EXD product that actually could be less expensive than the EXE product. However, the EXE product generally will last longer. Uh, it'll be more uh, easier to work on. It'll have some advantages there. And then when we start talking about the installation of cabling and cable glands, again, there's some cost savings generally associated with that. So what are some of the downsides? Well, again, missing bolts. If we damage our seals, that's a problem. Uh, improperly installed seals, right? We, we replace the seal with something that uh, we buy some sort of sealant and we replace it. That's no good. Uh, bolts tighten with the wrong torque, using the wrong plugs and cable glands. Generally, that's not an issue because almost every cable gland out there will be EXE. Uh, we don't mount the cable glands correctly. We don't use the right accessories. Making changes to the contents of the box. Again, adding terminals or non-EX components. And then again, our U component certificate, where it's a non-assembly certified box. We populate it with EX terminals and we think we're done, but the certificate and the label shows that it's a U certified product, which means it has to be uh, certified as a complete assembly. Oh, let me ask you a question while you're here at this uh, previous slide. Yeah. The, the EXC junction box with terminal uh -huh. block or a PLC panel inside requires that all the equipment inside is also certified for the area where it's going to be installed. For example, EXC, correct? You cannot just take a PLC that is known certified. That's correct, yeah. That's correct. So anything that's going on the inside of that enclosure has to have its own EX certification. So yeah, if you wanted to put a, a PLC or you know, if you took a barrier, right? We could take a barrier, uh, a GMI barrier, place that on the inside of the box. Now the barrier itself has a suitability to be installed in a zone two area. Um, now, if that box was zone one and we put a barrier in there that's only suitable for installation in zone two, then the default would be zone two. And the box itself would have to be certified for use with that barrier installed inside. So you're right. Anything that you want to put on the inside of an EXE enclosure must be EX certified in and of itself. Great. So if we go back to, oops, went the wrong way here. Here we go. <laughs> Pressurization. Pressurization, right? So now we're we're doing panels that look very similar to just general industrial panels, right? We're using sheet metal boxes. Um, you know, we can take in many cases a lot of industrial panels that might be suitable for general purpose applications. And by adding a pressurization system to it, we can basically make it suitable for hazardous locations. So again, like flame proof, we can now use our general purpose equipment in a hazardous area. So Paolo, kind of like what you said, in, in the case of pressurization, if I have a PLC that I wanna put into a hazardous area, well, my choices are I could find a certified PLC that's suitable for mounting inside of an EXE box, or I could take a general purpose PLC and put it into a pressurized enclosure, and that's an option. And again, like increased safety, it's not gas group dependent. We can also incorporate things like cooling features. Maybe we're in a high ambient, we've got some high temperature products. People can install things like vortex coolers to help cool off, maybe prolong the life of some of our equipment on the inside for those areas in which they're high ambients anything above 50 degrees C. And again, it's, it's well suited for PLCs, HMI. Uh, and we can do this same concept for buildings. So we could have a pressurized building. This is not uncommon and it's called EXPV. So there's a whole process in which we could actually do that. And that involves things like interlock doors, alarms, again, positive pressure. But now we can put all different kinds of general purpose equipment in a hazardous area inside of a complete building. So it's a very popular technology and it's, uh, it's very highly used in many markets. However, there are some issues. Uh, poor sealing. We don't want to just blow the air out of our enclosures or building. We need to seal it up, right? So generally speaking, we want good environmental seals uh, around our doors or enclosures or what have you. Uh, it also generally will require some sort of alarm or auto, even an automatic shutoff equipment. So under EXPX, 
for zone one, that's actually a requirement that if we lose positive pressure, we have general purpose equipment in a hazardous area, zone one, we actually have to shut off the panel. The quality of the air is important. Uh, we don't want to just be pumping in bad air. Uh, I've opened up purge enclosures in the past, and you have a lot of oil or contaminants all over on the inside of the equipment. So that's not necessarily a good thing. And again, adding components after certification, we want to make sure we minimize that as much as possible. Well, before you go to increase, it, oh, this is IS. Or oh, you... yeah. Advantage of IS, right? Before you go into that, we have a question that uh, pulls reverse of what I asked you. Is it possible to put a suitable PLC, so you know, a certified PLC for zone two, uh -huh. into a non certified panel, IAP65? Uh, yes, technically, yes. However, uh, depending on where in the world you're going, this, you may require certification of that panel with the PLC in it. Uh, for zone two under ATEX, under the ATEX directive, if we're following that, a manufacturer can issue what is called uh, an EU declaration of conformity, that the manufacturer has done a heat rise test or the panel builder or whomever it is, they can actually issue a DO, uh, EU DOC. If this was IECEX, no, you couldn't. You would actually have to get it certified as a complete assembly. Now, you could do that, and it's fairly simple, and you could do it under what is called unit verification, where you could do a one-off. Or if you said, I want to build 10 of these panels, I put a PLC in a sheet metal IP65 rated enclosure, so forth and so on. Now, here's the one issue you do need to be concerned or at least to be aware of. Uh, a standard IP enclosure looks very similar to an EXE box, and it may be identical. But the difference is on an EXE enclosure is that the manufacturer has done a couple tests that the IP rated enclosure may not have undergone. Number one, it could have gone through an impact resistant test. It also could have gone through an accelerated aging test for the gasketing. So the certification body, if they're going to certify a general purpose IP65 enclosure for use with a PLC, are going to have to do that testing or at least see some documentation from the manufacturer that they have done that testing. It would make much more sense to buy an empty EXE certified enclosure that's already been through that then put your PLC in there. And then again, you could issue your own under ATEX, your own D, uh, DOC, or under IECEX, you could go under unit verification. And the certification body would not have to test the enclosure and not have to test the gasket, not have to do any of that. The only testing that would actually be done on that is to do a temperature rise test to determine an overall T code associated for the product itself. That would be basically it. So you told me uh, uh, each year, on, we also had a question on temperature. It's been there for a little while. I don't know if you want to answer that now or later on. Yeah. Uh, it's what about it uh, what does the temper, surface temperature, what is affecting the surface temperature? So uh, yeah, depending on the protection concepts, the surface temperature could be on the inside of the enclosure. It could be on the outside of enclosure. What the standard says, we have to measure the relevant surface temperature. So every heat producing device or any device that has any resistance uh, is going to generate some sort of heat. So uh, what, for example, on a flame proof enclosure, we might have a lot of heat producing devices. So usually manufacturers will be able to provide some sort of data that says this will emit say 10 watts of generated heat. So we take all the information from all those components, right? And we might have a total of 80 watts of generated wattage on the inside of a flame-proof enclosure. Well, we have so much surface area or free air on the inside of the enclosure. Uh, at that point, we, we can make a determination. The T code is gonna be based on the outside of the enclosure. So we're gonna get some cooling effect from that enclosure. And that's where we're going to base our T code. And generally, it's going to be very, very low. Um, if, say, for example, we have a, a PLC um, that's certified EXNA or EC now, 
it'll have a temperature code associated with it. And that's going to be on whatever the relevant surface temperature is of the PLC. And again, it's going to be based upon the resistance, the amount of energy that's going into it, uh, the amount of energy that's turning into whatever. So all of that's got to be taken into account. And ultimately, we need to know that information in order to determine the T code associated with that product. Uh, and then again, a PLC manufacturer or an HMI manufacturer will have that information. But then when we combine that with other products in, say, a certain package system, then we need to add all that up, so to speak, and combine that and then make some calculations. I don't know if that answers the question or not, but hopefully it does. We have many other questions, but let's go through our um, end this okay. part of the presentation, then we'll I'll ask you some more questions. Yeah. Yeah, Murphy's Law says this is an advantage of IS, but you said increased safety. Yeah, yeah. So this is IS. So what is it is the safest EX protection concept out there it, it, when it's selected properly. And again, we can use, in many cases, non-EX certified equipment in the most onerous zone. If we use what are called simple devices, non-energy storing devices like a switch or a thermal couple, we can use those types of general off-the-shelf type products in a zone zero environment. Uh, if they're non-simple, if they're energy storing devices, then they do have to be certified. There's little maintenance and again, can be extremely cost effective. Some of the disadvantages, uh, it involves some engineering to match the associated apparatus to the device, right? We're limited to the minimum ignition energy. It's very easy to defeat or bypass. If we blow a fuse on an in, on intrinsically safe barriers and we're in the field, then I've seen this where people will just bypass the barrier. And at that point, we have no protection. Uh, when we use Zener barriers, we, did it, we do require a clean earth, which in many cases is very difficult to find. And then there are some strict uh, wiring requirements for separation between intrinsically safe and non-intrinsically safe. So inside that panel that you see there, you see a mishmash of IS and non-IS all mixed up. You can't do that. So some of the deciding factors, right? Again, if it's going into zone zero, IS is really the protection concept. If zone one, if a component exists that has EX certification, it may be more beneficial to consider multiple protection concepts, such as an EXDE control station, or even in that panel that we saw previously where we had a flame-proof box and an increased safety box. If EX components are not available, it makes sense to consider either D or P. If air is not available, then maybe EXD makes the best sense. Um, and one thing that we, we tend to forget about, what is the quality of the installers, right? Protect, some protection concepts require a little bit higher level of competency. The individuals who are doing the installation need to be aware of certain things, like what we just showed on intrinsic safety. Uh, the same thing holds true with increased safety. We have to be a little bit more concerned about the wiring methods that we're doing on increased safety. You know, flame proof and pressurization are, are generally the two methods in which we can pretty much do anything from a wiring standpoint on the inside of the panels, and we're not that much concerned. But these other protection concepts, we have to take that into account. There's also one thing if you see, there's another picture of a panel that's got basically flame proof and increased safety combined, right? But if you notice the picture on the right, in the, in the product on the right, you'll notice that there's actually three different protection concepts built into this one particular product. Uh, you can see at the top left, it, it's marked EXD, and which, by the way, now will be marked EXDB. Uh, down below, you see on the left-hand side, it's also marked EXIA. And on the right-hand side, you notice that it's also EXNA. So you find, in many cases, one product can be installed in different methodologies. It's important to understand when you're doing an installation or you're selecting a product to make sure that you follow the installation instructions for that protection concept. So for example, if we were to install this flame-proof converter, if you will, in, as intrinsically safe, then we might not have to use barrier glands and we might use blue cabling and do it that way. But if we're doing it as per EXD, we might require a barrier gland depending on how it's being installed. So you can find many cases, some products will actually have different protection concepts 
not only built into the product, but we can actually install it based upon the different protection concepts. So please be aware of that. That jumps up and bites people in the in the rear end sometimes. And we want to yeah. make sure they're following whatever the protection concept, that product, or however you wish to use it. So Bob, these two boxes here, sorry, go back one second, because we do have a question. Yeah. On the top, you have an EXD box, and the bottom, you have an EXE box, right? Correct. And so the, the question we have is, uh, how have they designed? It's one stock unit, they're two units, they must be certified together, they are? Yes, well, yes and no. <laughs> You can actually get a certified flame proof box, and then you can get a certified increased safety box, mm -hmm. and then you can use a stopping uh, or a sealing gland or a seal fitting and, and do an installation between the two. So you'd have a certification for the top box and a certification for the bottom box. But in this case, this manufacturer actually has them certified as a complete assembly. But yes, you could actually do what you're seeing there on the left-hand side, you could actually do that in the field and install right, as Using as a cable, you know, a sealing cable gland that you- Yes, in makes between. The seal between uh, the two there. Yes. How about, um, there was another question that also, it's my curiosity. If you have something certified for zone zero, take our product or, you know, well, it cannot be stored in zone zero. But, uh, can it also be used in zone one or zone two? Is it automatically yes. or do you yes. need certification yes. for? Yes, yeah, and I didn't say that, but yes, if anything is suitable for zone zero, then it is a default suitable for zone one and zone two. Again, a, from a zone standpoint, that's true. You also have to make sure that from a gas group standpoint, T code standpoint, all that, but yes, if I have a zone, if I have a zone one flame proof box, uh, I can use it in zone two all day, no problems. Uh, yeah, if, for example, if I take our bear, which are certified for um, signal from zone zero, so they have IA, X, EX, IA, I don't have to state they're also IB and IC. I, IA is also suitable for B. That's right. And, and you could see, and this is in a real world situation, right? You might have some zone, a handful of zone zero applications where you have some transmitters mounted in a zone zero, but then the rest of your facility has zone one or maybe even zone two. Generally speaking in the real world, you use one transmitter and you could use those in all the zones. And then you'd have one set of barriers that would be used. You wouldn't go out and necessarily select an IC barrier and select a, an IC transmitter because the cost differential will be so minimal. Now you've got two different parts and pieces it makes more economic sense. Yes, you're spending a little bit more on the equipment, but you don't have to think about, can I use this in, in this zone or only in this zone? So, right. all yeah. right. And then of course, deciding factors are things like glands, right? So what you see on the left-hand side, you see barrier glands that have not been properly installed. Things like tape, what you see down on the bottom left-hand side, cannot do that. Uh, the gland in the middle, somebody was using some sort of tape to try, try to provide a better seal. We're not allowed to use tape on glands. Uh, te Teflon tape, I see that all the time. Do not use Teflon tape, that's not allowed. A plastic gland on that, on that enclosure on the top, that might be suitable if that's installed as per EXIA, but in that case, it's not an EXIA installation, it's an EXD installation, therefore that's a problem. And then, of course, the things like shrouds, where you see it pulled back on that one on the lower uh, shrouds, I, I strongly suggest people don't use shrouds because they hide the problems. And in this case, we have an overheating of the cable and uh, we don't want to use shrouds. So things like glands, people don't necessarily think about those, but those are definitely important deciding factors. Installers, how to install it properly, doing all the right things. So... Kind of summarize, again, there are some generalities. Material costs are only one fact to consider. Again, what's our installed cost, the ease of maintenance, our skill set of the operators, uh, availability of replacement components, and certainly support from the manufacturer. Um, I always tell people, again, you know, if it's, a, if it's a grassroots or brand new facility, think about all the different protection concepts that you can use, right? And there are some creative ways that you can combine these protection concepts into much more elegant solutions. 
as opposed to just say, hey, let's just throw everything in a flame proof box or let's just throw anything, everything into a pressurized enclosure or do something like that. There are some creative ways that you can kind of address this to make it, again, simpler, easier, uh, and in many cases, more cost effective. And I would, yeah, we have another poll. Why we launched this poll about the meaning of you. That's a tough one, guys. I think, you know, decisions should also be made on, you know, how often do I need to access my panel as one of our guests say. And does it make sense to, if I have to open every day to put an EXT enclosure or a pressurized enclosure? Absolutely. Access to it for maintenance, for uh, doing whatever. Obviously, flame proof is one of those in which you've now got 40 bolts in which you need to remove. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen flame proof enclosures with maybe uh, four bolts installed, right? The, the operator technician doesn't know any better. You know, at that point, we've lost all of our protection, right? That's a dangerous situation. So yeah, the, the quality of, you know, how often you have to get into things, uh, the, the understanding of the operator technicians that are doing the work, they need to understand that these are built for a particular reason. Those bolts are there for a reason. So yeah, it's important. Great. So guys, uh, let me terminate. Well, you're still answering. I'm answering online. <laughs> Live <laughs> question. <laughs> I apologize. I'm running a little bit. You know, uh, you, you ask if uh, about the recording. Let me send it. You know, all our webinar recorded and later are sh uh, shared in our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, anyhow, we will send to all the participants a link to it uh, along with the slides. So let's terminate. I didn't really look at it. Which is the right answer, Bob? Yeah, the right answer is basically has a component certified. So if it has a U, uh, we should be aware of that. It's a component. So uh, just be aware of that. Okay, great. Here's what you wrote, different answers. Okay. Uh, so do you want me to stop sharing my screen? And sure. Then... If you guys, we have a few more minutes. If you guys want to stick with us, let me share our uh, presentation that we have prepared on the question and answer. You see it right, Bob? I haven't seen it yet, but hold on. I may. Yes. And it could be me. Yes, yes, I see it. I see it. Okay, so these are the question and answer you guys post through the registration process. If you stick yeah. with us a few more minutes, we'll go through it. First yeah, we'll go uh, specific question on using EX EB enclosure with EXD sensor in zone one. Yep. So, so yes, yeah, yes. yeah. So EXEB, that's that again, that that's the old EXE, and now they're known as EXEB. So we use EXEB terminals. Everything that goes on the inside of our EB enclosure does require certification. Now, if we have sensors. I'm assuming sensors are mounted exterior to the enclosure. So we could certainly use an EXE enclosure as a marshalling box or something like that. We have our EXDB sensors going outside of the enclosure, so to speak. Um, I don't know if I interpreted your question correctly, but yes, you could do this. You would just need to make sure that the cabling and glanding matches the protection concept. Uh, and that's an important thing on cables and glands. If it's an EXE box, we must use an EXE gland. If it's a D box, we must use a D gland, uh, so forth and so on. Great. So which are the best cable glands to consider for EX application? Do we need to use beta gland always with an EXD enclosure? I think you already answered this question, basically. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, you, you do, but you don't. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> Um, what this this is an example of one brand called Hawk, and they have what are called universal type glands. So the one on the left is basically uh, it is EXD, it's also EXE, it's also dust, and it's restricted breathing. Both of the glands down on the bottom are basically certified in exactly the same way. The one on the right hand side is a flame proof gland. The one on the left hand side also has the flame proof capabilities. So we could be using the gland on the left-hand side, direct entry into flame proof. But that's a whole nother webinar that we won't have time to get into. But if you have questions as far as which gland you would have to use into particular which enclosures. Um, that's, but the positive the thing is, yeah, the positive thing is those types of glands, those universal glands can be basically used in almost every protection concept. So you don't have to worry about different glands, so to speak. 
probably a little more expensive. So mechanical yeah. protection, what are the relevant standards and what do they apply? Yeah, so the mechanical standards, uh, and we've talked about this in some of the other webinars, there's what is called 36 and 37. Sorry. And, oh, no worries. Uh, this is a joint ISO IEC standard. Um, and the 36 talks about ignition sources of mechanical equipment. Uh, and then these seven ignition sources shall be assessed. The dash uh, 37 covers up the remediation concepts. So the various protection concepts that we can use. This is all considered to be what is now known as EXH. So that's the protection concept that we use for mechanical equipment. Okay, great. See a few more questions here. What are the main differences between US Canadian requirement for EX versus the rest of the world? Right, yeah. So we we in the US, we have adopted the 60079 set of standards. Uh, we publish them as a UO version of them. The difference is, is that in the US, you also have to meet the ordinary location requirements for EX equipment. So in the US, we can't just take a, an ATEX or an IEC EX piece of equipment and just install it for the National Electric Code. Now, that being said, uh, the installation that I was looking at here the last five, six days was all IEC EX. And the Coast Guard does accept IEC EX for offshore markets. But generally in the onshore market, uh, we have to follow the UL versions of the standards and not IEC EX. Uh, or we have to follow some of the other requirements. Which means Canada, double listing, double the cost. We know that. Yeah, it just way. adds more money. Yeah. <laughs> and again, Canada basically has, has done something similar. They're a little bit more relaxed than what we are in the United States. Can I install an ISB in a zone two environment? I'm not sure about the question. What does ISB mean? So, oh, in, intrinsically safe barrier. Oh, yeah. okay. But, but we can install them in a zone. We talked about this already. Oh, yeah, we, we had another one. Yes. If they're properly rated, you can. That's right. That's right. How to select device suitable to be used in particular areas such as zone 2, 2A yeah. class 2B, T3? Yeah. So the way you do this is that obviously we look at a label like what we see down below. I mean, obviously, if we're doing an inspection, we're doing it at the last minute. The equipment is already there. But we want to look at obviously the manufacturer's data. So in this case, it's telling us uh, the 2G and the GB is telling us it's good for zone one and two. Uh, the gas group is 2B plus H2. So it's good for uh, basically 2A, 2B and hydrogen gases. Uh, our requirement was T3 and this is rated T5. So we're A-OK. -okay. Is our What is our ambient? In this case, it's rated minus 20 to plus 55. Uh, what was our certification requirement? In this case, it was this unit happens to have both ATEX and IECEX, and it, they also marked it with an ingress protection rating as well. So that's how we kind of understand the labels to make sure that this product is suitable. But again, this information should be right in the manufacturer's data sheet to tell you all this good stuff so you don't have to read all that nomenclature. Bob, how about in the um, air purse? And panel, do we need to change the air regulator or is that automatically changes? How does that work? The, the air regulator, do we have to change it? No, the air inside it in, in a pressurized yeah. air. So, so there's, there's two different, well, yeah, there's two different kinds of pressurization. There's what is a continuous dilution, which is the most common. And then there's a, uh, I can't remember the term, but there's a non-continuous dilution where we basically pump in enough air to achieve positive pressure, then the air stops. The moment the air pressure drops below the prescribed level, then it kicks on again. So it's an on-off type situation. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we, we, we must maintain positive pressure in some way, shape or form. And it can be done again. A continuous uh, dilution is most common, but then the other one, and again, I can't remember the terminology, I'll remember it as soon as we finish, but that's another protection concept. <laughs> so guys, you have asked about our you know, different webinars. We have a live webinar schedule on our website. This is our YouTube channel where we record and a couple of days after the webinars we posted. Let me launch the, law, launch the last poll, which is about how do we do. Uh, let me end this. Um... Yeah.
Uh, uh, we did we did get a question also i just want to answer this one while we've yeah, got yeah, it yeah I was a conversion ask code from the old to the new ones and i assume you're talking about from exd now as exdb and so forth and so on mm -hmm. Uh, I know GMI's got a really nice wall chart that has all that information on there. And I think you've updated it with that. I know you've updated it with that. Yeah, we probably what we can do is we will, uh, I will ask Anna when we send out the, the slides to send you a copy of our uh, chart. Yeah. Which yeah. is soft copy, but then eventually you can request a hard copy for it. Yeah, yeah. But but definitely, I mean, yeah, the the... Uh, it's important to know that. And you'll see, again, you'll see that uh, old product that is already out there might be EXE, and then you buy a new version of it. It looks exactly the same, but then you'll see a DB. Um, and you'll kind of go, what's going on here? Well, that's the new marking requirements that have come out uh, in the last couple of years. And that's the answer. And that's the end. So guys, thank you for your, uh, for, uh, how do we call this, uh, your... Uh poll answer, you know, your evaluation on our webinar. Let me do this, stop this, so we can just be involved. Ciao, Bob. As usual, you know, this time was new to me also. Very interesting, very, very interesting. I was really enjoyed it. Oh, I, it was a lot of information. I know you probably may have more questions. Don't hesitate to reach out to us. So, as I said, uh, we'll talk soon. We run a little late, but not for that much. Only six minutes. Great, Bob. Have a All good right. day. I go home. Ciao, okay. ciao, guys. Thank you for participating. If you need anything, ciao. send us an email. We will try to, you know, reply. Ciao, ciao. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.